Well, this is our last week <clears throat> in the first letter of John, and um, next week is Pentecost Sunday, so I'm pretty excited about that. Everybody wear red. Isn't that what we do on Pentecost Sunday? I forget. I forget to warn people about that. <clears throat> The scripture reading comes from 1 John, the fifth chapter. I'm going to read verses 9 to 13. Listen for the word of the Lord. If we receive human testimony, <clears throat> the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. <clears throat> Will you pray with me and for me? <clears throat> oh God, may the words of my mouth and the thoughts of every heart be pleasing to you. And may my voice hold out just a few more minutes. Amen. <clears throat> so sorry. <clears throat> One morning a few years ago, I was driving um, down Highway 380. Uh, and, and I was going to meet with some colleagues as we were in the practice of doing once a month to just chat and then pray together. And I, I came upon this man who was walking briskly down the road, coming toward me, which I thought was, you know, kind of odd because he clearly wasn't looking for a ride. He was coming against the traffic. And I could see that he was carrying something, but it wasn't until I was practically upon him that I could see what it was that he was carrying. It, it was a cross, a large cross, uh, with wheels on the bottom, and it was lifted high on his shoulder. And it struck me as something quite interesting, and I really wanted to stop and talk to him, see what he was doing. But <clears throat> I was already running late, and I told myself, if I see him on my return trip, if he's still walking down this road, then I'll stop and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to him. And amazingly, on my way uh, home, he was there still walking along the road. And I flew by him at 65 miles an hour, which was the speed limit at the time on the section of road where I was driving. And um, I, had to st I had to find a safe place to turn around because I just couldn't let it go by again. I had to pull over. And so I did. It was not exactly safe for me to pull over on the shoulder of the road uh, with cars flying by me at 65, 70 miles an hour and jump out of the car. But, you know, that guy was walking down the road, too, and I thought, well, strength in numbers, maybe they'll see us. But, but I was suddenly re reminded how vulnerable and fleeting life truly can be in that moment. <clears throat> but still, I was compelled. I just had to stop and see what was going on. Maybe curiosity got the best of me. Maybe it was that little preacher brain going, oh, there could be a good sermon illustration in this. Um, but whatever reason, I ran up to him and I introduced myself and I said, I just have to ask you, what are you doing? <laughs> and he said to me, I'm bearing my burden and, and that seemed obvious, you know, on the front, <laughs> just on the face of it. Uh, but it was not really the answer that I was hoping for or looking for. So, so I just looked him right in the eye and I said, but why? Why? So he began to tell me his story a little bit. He said that the Lord had redeemed him. 
from his life, which he described as a pit of alcohol and drug abuse. And he was now on his way to Washington State to see his children. Now this guy was clean, his clothes were clean and pressed, <clears throat> they were new, uh, his eyes were clear, uh, he was clean shaven, you know, he just looked like a regular guy. He was not some lunatic out on a crazy mission to save the world by this XYZ date before Jesus comes back in a spaceship to take us all away, you know. It wasn't like that. He said to me, Jesus did a great thing for me when he died on the cross. And I want to bear my burden too. I just felt the Lord was asking me to do this. And I want to see my kids. I said, so you're going to carry that cross all the way to Washington? And he said, yes, unless the Lord comes up with a better plan. And, and, you know, in that moment, I wondered to myself if his kids were going to understand his attempt uh, to literally live out a metaphor <laughs> or if they would be at all impressed by his feet or what sins exactly did he feel like he needed to atone for if Jesus had already done that for him. But, but I hadn't stopped to pass judgment on the guy. I would, just wanted to know what his motivation was. And this was his journey. It was his own journey. And whatever it was that he or the Lord hoped to accomplish through that, his act to me was most definitely a bold witness to his faith. Throughout the letter of 1 John, we have heard this theme, God is love, over and over and over and over. Jesus came to testify to that love. And we are to emulate Jesus in that witness through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us. That Spirit, 1 John says, God's Spirit, gives testimony to the truth that is within in Christ. It's a truth that is in Christ and it testifies to God's presence in Jesus. Now it is true John says that we trust human testimony all the time. We do, right? We just believe what our friends tell us. If we didn't believe in the testimony of other people, we would never watch the news or read the paper or believe it when someone tells us they saw a guy dragging a cross down the highway, right? John asks, if, I, if I'm going to trust that human testimony... Testimony that I cannot know is true because I did not see it for myself. If I'm willing to believe that, how much more then should I trust God's testimony that Jesus is God's son and that, as we said last week, faith is Jesus conquering power that brings the world to its knees. God, John says, has revealed this to us over and over again. And if we don't believe it, then we simply don't believe God. We're calling God a liar. Of course, none of us are going to say that God is a liar, are we? No. Uh, to the contrary, we would say that God is incapable of telling a lie, that God is nothing but truth, God is full of truth, and that we do believe what God's Word tells us. We believe the witness of the Word. <clears throat> But John is not going to stop pestering us about this. And just like last week, his word calls us to examine our faith, our actions, our behavior, and ask ourselves the question, do we believe this with our lives? It's not just that we assent to the truth claims. I, I, I bet most of the people in the room would willingly assent to the truth claims that we have at the core of our faith. But do we live out loud what we believe, what we say we believe? Do we believe it in what we do? Are we giving testimony to our faith, to what we say we believe? John's whole purpose in writing this letter 
he tells us in verse 13 is simply this, that we who believe in God's Son will have no doubt whatsoever that we have eternal life. Not the illusion of eternal life, not some real far-out hope of eternal life, but real, actual, eternal life. Life that begins right now in this moment and then goes on forever. And that makes me think, you know, I know the definition of eternal. I know kind of what forever is, even if I can't actually grasp no beginning and no ending. That's a really hard for a human brain to comprehend. <clears throat> but that life begins in this moment when I believe, when I accept the reality that Jesus is alive and lasts forever and ever and ever and has no end. And, and the other part of this, the life, is a Greek word. We've talked about this before a little bit. The Greek word zoe. And zoe is a special kind of word for life. It, it means all of you, everything that animates you. <clears throat> Zoe is your aliveness. It's your um, personality, your movement, your breath, your thinking, your feeling, your devotion, your personality, all that makes you you. And John means for this, this whole of your Zoe, this whole of your aliveness to be caught up in Jesus and his glory beginning now <clears throat> and forever. Yes, but now Eugene Peterson, um, uh, whom I turn to frequently to put into words things that are hard for me, uh, in, in his translation, the message, he renders this concept of eternal life as the life. That's what he calls it, the life, as in the only life, no other life. Verse 11, he says, God gave us eternal life. The life, the life is in his Son. <clears throat> So what John is saying to us, and what Peterson helps uh, to make so clear, is that if you really want to live, if you want to know unspeakable joy and indescribable peace, if you want to know the conquering power of the faith that brings the world to its knees, if you want to be the whole person that God created us all to be, complete, perfected, whole, there is only one way to do that, and that is through Jesus, the Christ, the Son of God. And so my question for us is again today, do you believe that? Do you believe that that Christ, that life lives in you? If you believe it, do you possess it within yourself? Do you know that it is true in the core of your being? Does the Spirit of God bear witness of it inside you, in, in your spirit, with your spirit? And does this witness then make itself known to the world? If God's Spirit bears witness to God's presence in Jesus Christ, in his baptism, in his death, and in his resurrection, then if Jesus lives in you, in, in you, in us, God's Spirit ought to bear witness the same way in, in us. Peterson says, whoever has the Son has the life. Whoever has the Son has the life. The real, authentic life of wholeness and peace and joy that is both now and forever. So how do we know? How do we know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we have this eternal life? the reality of it and not the illusion of it? How do we know that we've more than assented with our mind to faith claims and that it is alive in us? <clears throat> John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, which became a church, had that same question. He asked himself this question for many, many years. Uh, it plagued him. It grabbed hold of him and would not let him go. Wesley had been wrestling for some time with this idea of what true salvation really is, of, of this aliveness, and he wasn't sure that he had it. He did not know that he possessed it. Now, this is an Anglican priest 
who has been raised by an Anglican priest and a mother who ought to have been a priest also if they had allowed her to be ordained. This woman was a brilliant genius and she trained up all of her children at her knee. And so Wesley's been wrestling with this for many years of his life. <clears throat> and he goes off to America at some point and he tries to do good things in America. And uh, he's a good, John Wesley is a do-good person. He does many, many good things to live out his faith. Um, but So he goes to America, and he thinks he's going to do some more good things in America. And uh, he does some things that are not actually good and ends up running away in the middle of the night uh, because he just messed up, right? He made, he made some mistakes. We've all, we've all been there. But Wesley has been working so hard for most of his life to make sure that he was all that God had created him to be, but he was very often certain that he fell far short of what that meant. Um, and he was tired and he felt very discouraged. And, and this story, I don't know about you, gives me a lot of hope for myself. <laughs> because if one of the great heroes of our faith can get discouraged and not really know if he has enough faith, and, you know, maybe it's okay for me to have a doubt or two every once in a while. But Wesley writes in his journal that he had been strictly taught that he could only be saved by obedience, by keeping all the commandments of God, and that he had been diligently instructed in the meaning of those commandments. Yet this knowledge did not seem to be working in his favor. He, had the, he knew the rules, he had them in his brain, he was living them in his life. But he was still doubting. So he says, I'm quoting from his journal, he set an interest upon a new life. Wesley set aside two hours every day for prayer, two hours every day for prayer. He took communion weekly, often daily, sometimes more than once a day. And he says, he watched against all sin, whether in word or deed. How many of us can say that, honestly? <laughs> He watched against all sin, whether in word or deed, and began to aim at and pray for inward holiness. He studied more. He read more spiritual writings. He visited prisons. He fed the poor. He tended the sick. He lived frugally. He observed days of fasting and omitted no sort of self-denial which he thought lawful. Now, doing so, <clears throat> it's so much of this and having such a good life he writes I doubted not but I was a good Christian yet for all of his efforts Wesley felt no comfort or assurance of acceptance with God no comfort or assurance of acceptance with God some days were better some days are harder he says but he did not possess the witness of the spirit with my witness this thing that first John keeps writing about this testimony that lives within us now we're talking about this man who has been ordained at this point for more than a dozen years um, and here he is seeking God with his whole heart not confident in his salvation I don't know if this resonates with you or not. Or at, maybe at some points in your life it has resonated with you. But he wasn't sure that he was saved, even though he was so good. On the morning of May 24th, um, 1738, uh, this is the day that we still celebrate and remember as Aldersgate Day. Wesley opened his Bible that morning to 2 Peter, which read, there, there are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, even that ye should be partakers of the divine nature. Even that ye should be partakers of the divine nature. Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You know how you're wrestling with something sometimes and like everything around you just seems to be speaking into that space that you're wrestling with? That's how Wesley felt. Like, like God was, you know, speaking into that question. Uh, so he, he writes, In the evening 
I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, a meeting of like-minded Christians, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistles to the Romans. So Luther had written an introduction to the letter of Romans, similar to what you probably find in your Bible. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Wesley, at that moment, gave testimony to the people who were gathered there about what had happened to him, about this warming he had experienced. But, but as he headed home that evening, the doubts began to creep in. <laughs> and he writes that he persisted in prayer, lifting his eyes to heaven and received comfort from God. The next afternoon, he reports, the tempter continued to assault him with fear creating doubt in his mind, asking him if his transformation was real. Uh, why hadn't there been a more sensible change in his person? Why he continued to struggle with these doubts in his mind? And Wesley responded that he did not know the reason for that. But what he knew was that he now possessed peace with God. That's what he had been looking for. And the question then arose for him, <clears throat> but is not any sort of fear a proof that you do not believe? Is any sort of fear a proof that you do not really believe? You don't really have the confidence of your faith. Determined to silence these doubts with the word, Wesley grabbed up his Bible, which fell open to these words from Paul. Without were fightings within were fears. Then inferred I, Wesley writes, well may fears be within me, but I must go on and tread them under my feet. John Wesley worked so hard to obtain this kind of peace in his life, this confidence in his salvation. He wanted to be a righteous person according to the laws of God. He wanted his life to be a living witness to the love and holiness of God. He had more than a passing intellectual belief in God. He was working hard to live out his faith. He was a highly trained theologian, a man of deep thought and prayer. But it was the witness of the Holy Spirit within him that he needed in order to make that faith come alive. And Wesley's experience radically altered the trajectory of his life and his ministry. He did produce a change after his experience at Aldersgate. He started doing things like preaching in the streets that made the people who knew him wonder if he was going out of his mind. He was denied access to many church pulpits because of this kind of radical behavior. And eventually, he came very close to losing his own ordination status. They, they, the church considered revoking his ordination because he was preaching from places other than the church pulpit, because he was creating these societies and moving people to do more than just have an assent to their faith in their mind. In the fourth chapter of Acts, Peter and John have been preaching about Jesus outside the temple, and they've been arrested. After spending the night in jail, they are dragged before members of the Sanhedrin, Annas and Caiaphas and others, just as Jesus had been there just a few weeks before. After being threatened and commanded not to teach or speak anymore in the name of Jesus, Peter and John reply this, you have to decide for yourselves what you think is right, whether we ought to obey God or obey you. But one thing is for sure, we cannot help but talk about what we have seen. 
and heard. Friends, these are ordinary men. They're fishermen. A respectable enough job, but they have no formal training in public speaking, in theology. They have no seminary degrees. <clears throat> They're average blue-collar workers. But here they are, standing boldly in the face of possible death, saying to their tormentors, well, you have to do what you think is right. But our lives are a living witness to the one who offers us real life. Their lives have been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within them. That Holy Spirit came rushing down on Pentecost and filled their lives. And they were pushed out into the street. What does it mean to possess this kind of spirit, this kind of eternal life, the life? to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we possess the reality of it and not the illusion of it, that it's real and not just an ascent. We know when God's Spirit moves us inwardly, don't we? We know when we say yes to that stirring within us, when we pay attention to that Holy Spirit that is moving and alive when our lives outwardly reflect the truth that is within us. First John tells us that when the Spirit lives within us, we will stand bold and free before God. Yes, <clears throat> this removes the sin stain, uh, the message calls it, of our lives, that, that burden that we've carried. <laughs> but it also gives us the courage and the ability to do things that we never would otherwise attempt, to bear living witness to the God who lives within us. And I don't know for you, God may not be asking you to build a cross and throw it over your shoulder and travel to Washington, <laughs> walk across the country bearing your burden for all to see. And God may not ask you to start a renewal movement within the church. Uh, and God may not ask you to go out and preach to people who would rather see you dead. But God is asking you to do something. God is asking you to bear witness to the reality, the truth of God that lives within you. Not just by following the rules and doing good but that it comes alive in you, that you know it beyond a shadow of doubt. And that is when the witness comes flowing out. We can't help but, but let it come out of us. We can't contain that kind of aliveness of God. And can you imagine a church that is filled with that kind of witness that kind of living testimony to the truth of God within us, can you imagine what that would look like? Let's pray together. Holy God, we, we long for your spirit to come into our lives and inhabit us, inhabit our very being, to make us alive with your zoe, the life breath of you. We long for that living witness to, to come in and move us and inspire us and free us from fear. We know you are there, God. We believe. Help us show the world what we believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.